In May 1961, a huge unprecedented fire ripped through the urban kampong of Bukaho Sui, not far from where I stand today. But the fire isn't historically significant for the damage it caused, but for also being a pivotal moment in Singapore's history towards its housing policy and situation. But why is this? Let's go find out. Kampongs, semi-autonomous communities commonly home to low-income Chinese families, were freely built, unauthorised wooden houses, and they once dominated Singapore. But the Bukit Ho Sui fire turned Singapore into a city now dominated by high-rise blocks of planned public housing. Today, HDB flats are one of the most recognised aspects of Singaporean living. They are home to 80% of Singapore's resident population, of which about 90% own their own home. But the journey here can be traced back to the Bukit Ho Sui fire of 1961. After the Second World War, Singapore experienced an influx of immigrants, many of whom who settled in urban kampongs. And by the early 1960s, these kampongs housed over a quarter of Singapore's urban population. The kampongs largely functioned as autonomous areas, with many residents taking up jobs in an informal economy. This autonomy of the kampongs led to the colonial government perceiving them as socially undesirable areas which they had little authority over. So logically for them, the government's preferences for kampongs where they wanted them to be cleared and replaced with more traditional, yet more modern, public housing. The need for better housing is recognised by the Republic of Singapore as one of its most pressing problems. One government approach to the problem has been to build housing estates. The British colonial government in Singapore, through the Singapore Improvement Trust, was pushing hard for public housing development to support Singapore's industrialisation process. Kampongs were often cleared to free up land for the construction of public housing units, yet the high rents and small size of the flats meant that they were not popular with residents of urban kampongs. Justifiably, many residents chose to remain in kampongs. But this situation of managing the reality for lower class citizens of Singapore, alongside the government's plans for a more modern, industrialised society, would soon be thrust to the forefront in the aftermath of the Bukit Ho Sui fire of 1961. So kampongs, made out of wooden structures, made their fire risk more of a case of when, not if. Improperly disposed rubbish, burning joss sticks in religious rituals, and the use of firewood for cooking, all meant that kampongs were constantly only an errant spark away from going up in flames. And not just the fire risk, the fire brigade solution wasn't much better. For Singapore's entire population of over 1.4 million people in 1957, they only had 25 officers... 37 subordinate officers, and only 370 other firefighters. But it was Thursday, May 25th, 1961. Coincidentally, the same day that JFK announced America's goal of putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade. But here in Singapore, it was the Hari Raya Haji public holiday, the biggest holiday celebrated within Islam. On this day, the Singaporean Fire Brigade was already behind the eight ball, as many of the firefighters were Malay Muslims who had taken leave to celebrate the festival making an already depleted fire brigade even more susceptible. At 3.30pm, a small fire started in the neighbouring kampong, Tiong Baru. The wind conditions and flammable nature of the kampongs meant that the fire spread quickly, and the scale of the fire was immense, with an area of approximately 100 acres being gutted. Over 2,000 dwellings were destroyed, more than 15,000 people left homeless, and four people unfortunately lost their lives. The Bukit Ho Sui fire peaked around 8pm, with 22 fire engines having been deployed. The inferno was eventually extinguished at around 10pm, but not before the fire had left a massive trail of destruction in its wake. After the fire, a national state of emergency was declared, and local schools became temporary relief centres. Given that the residents escaped with few of their belongings, the fire also significantly damaged the local economy within the kampongs. And as the government stepped in, this was when the wheels of change really started to turn. The response to the fire by the People's Action Party was swift. The PAP, sensing an opportune moment to implement their public housing development plans, leveraged the Bukit Ho Sui fire and the subsequent emergency construction of public housing for their own political purposes. They wanted their newly completed public housing flats to showcase the progress of Singapore, demonstrating to both locals and the international community how Singapore had transformed itself from dangerous settlements into a modern metropolis that could provide immaculate and safe housing for its people. For the PAP, the fire enabled the government to remodel the kampong dwellers into disciplined citizens, into planned housing, who 
who contributed regular rental payments as workers in a new industrial economy. In other words, it tamed the ambivalent zones of the Kampongs and transition residents to the new Singapore, and in the process, to the government. The transformation effectively became a metaphor for the progress of Singapore under the PAP. But who would be responsible for this massive housing project, bringing all these grand plans to life? That task would fall to Singapore's Housing and Development Board. But who are the HDB? As mentioned, after World War II, Singapore experienced rapid population growth, with the population nearly doubling from 940,000 in 1947 to 1.7 million in 1957. And in the Kampongs, living conditions were less than ideal. The current organisation responsible for public housing in Singapore was the Singapore Improvement Trust, or SIT. SIT was trying to achieve the same goals of moving Kampong residents to better public housing, but they faced many problems. Rents for flats were too low to be financially sustainable for SIT, yet they were also unaffordable to many of those poorer in Singapore. So HDB was founded in 1960 to take over the Singapore Improvement Trust's mess of public housing responsibilities. But HDB was off to a slow start. By April 1961, just before the Bukit Ho Swee fire in May, they had only built just over 2,000 units of housing in the 14 months since inception. But things were about to start moving quickly. In the aftermath of the fire, HDB focused on the construction of emergency housing and the resettlement of Kampong residents into public housing. And with over three housing units completed per day at Bukit Ho Swee, the speed of construction demonstrated that the PAP and HDB were able to deliver on their housing promises. This success by the PAP and the public support gained paved the way for future legislation changes. With the Land Acquisition Act in 1966, giving the government power of compulsory land acquisition for public development, which ended up paving the way for HDBs to flourish in the future. By 1966, there were over 12,000 flats in the Bukit Ho Swee estate, capable of housing an estimated 75,000 people, five times the number who had previously lived in the Kampong. And as a result of the aftermath of the Bukit Ho Swee fire and the resulting political capital it gained from the event, HDB estates steadily replaced Kampongs in Singapore throughout the 60s. Over 12,000 families were moved from their homes in the HDB's first five-year plan, of which three quarters moved to planned resettlement areas or accepted HDB flats. By 1965, there were over 50,000 units of public housing flats, accommodating 23% of the population. And this growth of public housing in Singapore never really slowed down. Today, HDBs are home to 80% of Singapore's resident population, of which about 90% own their own home. The Bukit Ho Swee fire is a pivotal yet underrecognised part of Singapore's history. It allowed the government to act on their disapproval of unauthorised housing, clear kampongs and integrate the population into the social fabric of the state. Bukit Ho Swee, what a record. Fantastic, says every visitor to Singapore. And were the PAP's actions of clearing lower class citizens from their kampongs a continuum of colonial policy? Or were they just trying to help propel Singapore forward? It could be a combination of both, but I'll let you decide.